So uh, I think uh, we have, uh, as uh, Alwani has said, that very uh, students have uh, attempted uh, their assignments and completed their assignments in a very good manner. So I think uh, uh, we are well in time. So we should start. Uh, I invite Dr. Vikas to uh, uh, introduce or uh, formally start this uh, session as he is the moderator of today's uh, session. Dr. Vikas, are you there? So I think, uh, ma'am, uh, we should start. Uh, Mr. Ma'am, your mic is off. Your mic is uh, off. Uh, Kulvinderji, may I take just five yeah. minutes or six minutes? Uh, sure, 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 sir. About uh, those the spreadsheets which I was talking about. Okay. Just, uh, okay. it is seven, uh, five past six minutes, okay? So maybe by five parts, uh, 12 minutes, I should finish it off. Okay, sir. So I'll just go for presenting. Can you see my uh, spreadsheet? Are you able to view the, my spreadsheet? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I will uh, make it still bigger so that uh, we are able to see that. Mm. Uh, I think this is fine. Fine, sir. So, uh, I hope uh, uh, this is actually a, a spreadsheet, a rather workbook based on Ma'am uh, Sarmishtha's yesterday's lecture. In fact, this is what I was doing when Ma'am was actually talking about that uh, Tambola uh, exercise in which she helped us to, uh, you know, uh, generate true random number generators uh, uh, numbers through a true random number generator. So she was putting your hand in the uh, bag and pulling out one number and there was no algorithm involved in that. So that was the case of the true random number generators. So you can really go through this and uh, I did some calculation here, small calculation to calculate the uh, distance of each point from the origin in the first quadrant to decide whether that is lying in the uh, first quadrant or not. And then I had uh, a kind of a continuous summation also. For example, here it was one. Those which are vacant actually, those are the ones in which there, these red means that uh, they were out of that quadrant. Uh, semi or what you call quadrant circle and uh, then once I was knowing 15 as this number I was also knowing this total are how many these were 20 actually so out of these 20 15 were lying within the quarter circle so I calculated using that ratio of numbers the value of pi and hence the area and I also calculated the error involved so this was one. Second I am very keen to show you is the distribution of random numbers. I tried to generate a pair of random numbers and I plotted them in a square. I hope you can see from 0 to 1 and 0 to 1. By default, Excel pseudo random number generates uh, between 0 and 1 itself. And then what I did was I divided the these numbers into classes numbers lying between 0 and 0, 0.1 and 0 and so on. So these were 10 classes. And then I saw how many are lying in each class. And to visualize it, I plotted this bar chart also. So one can fairly easily say that in each class, uh, which is of uh, interval 0.1, girls are uh, almost one tenth. And then I calculated average also. So the average comes out to be 100 of these numbers. So this is what we expected if it is a uniformly uh, distributed random number generator. And you can see that these points are also uniformly distributed in this picture. I have already posted this workbook in the 
uh, cell. Then uh, calculating the value of pi using random number. This is once again the same exercise which Ma'am did later using random numbers itself. So I was also doing this simultaneously, and it, I really enjoyed doing it. Um, then I come to this small, you know, uh, exercise which I have done. In this exercise, you can see this curve of radioactive decay. So I want to just tell you how I generated it. Actually, this way of doing experiments on computer is known as Monte Carlo method. So in radioactivity, you know, you start with a sample of particles at time t is equal to zero. That is 15,000. And then you decide about that decay constant, probability of decay actually, 0 0.5 I have taken here. And then what I did was actually to calculate these numbers, I have to check out of these 15,000 numbers, which one have decayed and which ones have not decayed. So for that, what I did was I uh, wrote a small user-defined function trial in which actually two inputs go. One is the number of particles in the uh, at time t is equal to zero. And after one minute or after one trial, how many number of particles are left undecayed and the probability of decay itself. So let me try to see if I can show you this uh, module somewhere. Can you see this module? Uh, I think, uh, let me see if I can uh, uh, make this bigger. I am not able to make this bigger, okay? But I think I'll read it for you. Uh, try to see, I start with a counter, n is equal to zero. When I start a trial, the number of particles left undecayed is zero. Then I run a loop. For next loop I am running, this is from basic language only. So I go over uh, a, this loop for all the n0 number of particles. And then I generate a random number. Mind it, this is not random number function, which is built in in Excel. This is a random number generator of the basic or visual basic. If you will write that uh, uh, function itself here, which is built inside the Excel, it doesn't work. And then I check if X is less than P, then I'm declaring, declaring that uh, how many num that particle has decayed. And if it is not, then I just don't in in increment. And then finally, I will try to write down how many number of particles are left with me. And I call this function there. So this is exactly what I did. So you can see here uh, this trial function and how it is actually taking the number of particles in the left undecayed in the last step and using the same probability. I have given these names, mind it, so that they become absolute reference uh, numbers. This is also 15,000. And let me just change something and hopefully you will be able to see uh, something happening in the graph itself. So what can I change? I think the best uh, thing to change is, uh, let me come back to the view uh, which is 100% uh, only, right? So you will be able to appreciate it better now because you will be able to see it. So what I do is I change this to say 0 0.6 and then I press enter. Did you see that the curve shifted? May I get a response? <laughs> So once again, I'm doing it. Let me change it to 0 0.3. Did you see that? Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. So this is how it works. So this is a beautiful example of using a user-defined function. Otherwise, you know, I had to do what I had to do. I had to sit in the Excel sheet and I had to do my random number. Or we decide karta, ki wo particle decay ho gaya hai, ho gaya. Now that task, which is actually you know, a repetitive task, has been done by using a loop. Loop where? Loop inside this small user-defined function called trial. And the job is done. Today, uh, Professor Kulvinder has also posted one very interesting uh, article that how 
this kind of a method called monte carlo method is used for uh, uh, doing uh, experiments in nuclear physics uh, yesterday also whole of the session which ma'am did was based on this strategy itself and i hope you must have read the blog posted by professor kulvinder monte carlo is a city uh, where people play uh, and go play in casinos casinos i hope you know the where people they play games uh, involving uh, gambling so that is why you know th this method uh, because it makes use of probabilities and you don't you are never sure whether you are going to win or lose uh, we call these as the monte carlo method and they play a very big role in doing simulations in physics statistical physics and nest matter physics in uh, quantum monte carlo and this method is so simple that it can really simulate wonderful things a uh, number of people are there who have really won nobel prizes using this method itself so i think you will enjoy understanding and appreciating this method so i hope you will play with this uh, worksheet which i have already posted and enjoy uh, learning and exploring excel further so i think that's all what i wanted to say uh, uh -huh. and so i will just stop presenting so just one minute one yeah. minute in the radioactivity uh, i have a feeling because when you are doing 0.5 it showed a particular graph when you did 0.3 i think it is showing the graph for 0.7 maybe it has been one minus sign yes. i think yes. so, so actually <laughs> i just wrote it p Yeah. So whether I am calling calling it as a probability of decay or uh, opposite to that, okay, it depends. I didn't elaborate on that, but you are correct. Yeah. Okay. Because you know, suddenly graph went very steep. Yeah. Yeah. So point three looks like that it is a probability of decay which is very slow, and it should not have been like that. It is corresponding to higher probability. This kind of a curve should come for higher probability. right so uh, i think uh, the point is valid i knew this but i didn't elaborate on that very much yeah okay thank you very much sir okay. it was a great thing and uh, if children take interest and uh, things start playing with it i'm sure they will learn a lot so yes. please take this opportunity sir is spending so much of time making things ready for you so please make sure that you use it thank you sir thank you very much uh, now i request uh, dr mr shaw please uh, continue the session yeah so i will go straight away to uh, presenting my ppt uh, please help me i'm trying to do it in the best possible way I can't make out which is what. Right. Okay. <laughs> Again, I'm having the same problem. Okay. Present. Uh, you want to share your screen? I want to share my PPT. Okay. okay. Let me see. No, it's not coming. Any uh, play the PPT? It is already shared. Play it. Ah, uh, it is already shared. Oh. Play it. No, but where is the thing? Stop presenting. It says no, no, no. no, no you no. you are presenting. Actually, just now bring your PPT. Bring your PPT. That's it. Oh, okay. Oh. Acha. Okay, okay. Now is it okay? Yes. We are able to see. You are able to see. Acha. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you really so much. Okay. Um. Uh. Good afternoon, children. Uh. Today we are talking about. something that all of us have done right from class 7 8 9 and that is an oscillator so what exactly is an oscillator how we can learn from it i will try showing uh, slides first and then i will show you in terms of excel sheet uh, so the topic is classical as well as quantum oscillator and sir calls it troubleshooter of physics i would like to hear from sir after the uh, thing whole thing is over 
what exactly he is targeting when he's saying it is a troubleshooter. And I will keep that uh, thing discussion open after the session is over. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Yes, and I want sir to kindly do it. Uh, okay, now what is this? Children, like last yesterday evening, I want you to interact. I really do not want to become a uh, sage on the stage. I should not be talking and giving uh, sermons and you will listen. I want you to participate and you to answer and ask questions so that we can also answer to your questions. Okay, now what is this? Please unmute yourself and tell what is this? What is this? What happened? Nobody is answering. Students, please. Interact. Please answer. Please. And then, huh, what is this? Uh, so please answer, otherwise I will take too long a time to complete my work. And I want you to tell it is a block spring. Yes, it is a spring mask system. Okay. Now, are these three things different? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Are yes. the motions different? Yes, ma'am. The movement of these three things, are they different? Yes, ma'am. Or are they similar? They are similar. They Not are exactly similar. The same. Yeah. Okay. So what is the similarity? At least one similarity. Can you tell me? They are oscillating about the main point. Fantastic. They are oscillating about a point. Yes. They, from one point, they are going either left, right, left, right, or up, down, up, down. Okay, so all the movements are similar. And this type of movement is known as oscillation. Now, please look at these pictures. What is the first person uh, thing, the monkey doing? What is the frog doing? What is the tunic folk doing? They are oscillating. They are also oscillating. oscillating. So all of them are oscillating. We are now seeing a couple of them where the motion is something similar to each other. And therefore, all these are one word oscillations. Now, what exactly is the difference? We will look at it. And then we will see where, how close they are from each other. Now, all the similarities that you saw in these previous pictures in various or at least six different situations is very, very conspicuous. Can you please suggest what are the similarities? One of them you already told that it is moving about its midpoint and therefore it is going either sideways, that is left to right, right to left and so on. And so then you also said that one of them is moving up and down. Fantastic. No matter what direction, they are moving about a fixed point. What is the other things that are similar about them? The first one you said, they are periodic, they are repeating themselves. The motion was repeated, that is why it is periodic. And it was moving about a fixed point, is the first similarity. Is there any other similarity? I've put up the pictures, so if you don't, uh, I mean, uh, don't hesitate to answer even if you have seen it. Please tell me, what is the similarity? Could you realize that, okay, I think probably you are not able to realize, I'm just mentioning it, then I will show it to you. 
in all these cases the acceleration and the displacement were opposite to each other if the acceleration was downward displacement was upward and vice versa or if the acceleration is left the displacement was to the right and so on the other similarity was in all these cases the acceleration was always directed to the midpoint probably you could not realize how the acceleration was changing by looking at the pictures so now i will show you a picture where acceleration is marked look at this spring system where it has a red color mass and it is moving up and down about a midpoint that midpoint has been marked over here with a green line that means the spring mass is now moving down but the acceleration is upwards now the spring mass is moving up and the acceleration is downwards it is moving down the acceleration which is the green line is moving up it is moving up and the acceleration is moving down so now you can become very clear that the acceleration as well as the displacement are always in the opposite direction and look at the acceleration arrow you will always find whether it is upwards or it is downward it is always pointing towards this central point that is it is pointing towards the center now look at it carefully when this is moving from the midpoint upwards the acceleration is also growing when it is moving down from the midpoint the displacement is increasing the acceleration is also increasing in magnitude but it is always in the opposite direction please watch it for 1 minute carefully then we will continue the discussion look at the change in that green line length the length is proportional to the magnitude of the acceleration the arrow direction tells us about the direction of the acceleration so now are you convinced that all the all the while acceleration is always pointing towards the midpoint is it clear yes ma'am yeah can you also make out that when it is getting displaced displacement means that red box is moving away from the midpoint that is the displacement the corresponding acceleration is also growing in magnitude but it is always opposite in direction yes, is watch and to see if it is that or something else yeah now i'm going back again so now tell me the similarities of all these things this is true not only for the spring mass system but in all the cases i'm not going to draw the pictures once again but i want you to tell me what are the similarities first one you have already told me second similarity one of you please tell me are you listening or are you there or not there <laughs> displacement are opposite yes acceleration is always point uh, and directed towards the main point fantastic so these are the three major similarities in all the cases i'm just showing you one picture if you take <clears throat> if you look at this axiom i think movement you will be able to realize something all these graphs that i've drawn on the right hand side can be done with the help of your spreadsheet i have already plotted this graph but i would request you to do on your spreadsheet probably today we will not be able to, uh, able to do it simultaneously but do it at home but watch the graph what it is saying the red point is telling as time passes by the displacement is changing like a curve the velocity of that mass is also changing like a curve and the acceleration of that corresponding mass is also a curve is there any similarity between the displacement and the acceleration the displacement is plotted on the first on top acceleration is plotted on the third position so watch the displacement this yellow curve
complementary okay we'll not use the word complementary if i call this there is a phase difference of pi by 2 with respect to the first curve and the second curve if i call this as a sine curve then i will call this as a cosine curve because here when this is maximum this is zero when this is zero this is maximum when this is maximum this is zero and so on so there is a phase difference between the two which is equal to pi by 2 so therefore the velocity is looking slightly different from the displacement and the acceleration and otherwise they are similar in the sense all of them are sinusoidal if i call the first curve as sin the second one is cos the third one is minus sin then all of them are sinusoidal so that is the similarity but the difference uh, we have just now discussed so we know how the acceleration and the displacement of a body which is moving up and down about its mean position should be but this i have simply picked it up from somewhere i want you to do it yourself and to find out that this is true okay so looking at this curve suppose i say that the displacement is looking like a sinusoidal curve and it is repeating itself since it is repeating it should have a frequency let me call that angular frequency as omega and this is changing with respect to time and therefore i can write an equation satisfying the first curve let us say and hence say that displacement is equal to some constant which i'm calling it as the amplitude cos omega t plus phi okay and i'll be perfectly fine if i call it as cos or sin as i mentioned it before i purposely wrote it as cos because i want you to understand the meaning of this phase angle or epoch which is which i have written it as phi so if i call this as a cosine curve we know from our knowledge that if i consider this point to be equal to 0 then a cosine should have maximum uh, the displacement but in this case it is having zero displacement therefore there is a change in its phase and that phase is represented by this symbolic representation which i am calling it as an epoch okay now let's not discuss more about the mathematical statement i can mane say that it is a correct equation there is no problem with that equation now what is this a what is omega what is t what is phi let us proceed and we will understand them okay so if i consider this to be the equation for the displacement what should be the corresponding equation for velocity can anybody answer please velocity is equal to dx by dt derivative of this term okay, yes first derivative of the displacement and therefore what should it be just derive it in your head and tell me a omega sin omega t plus phi fantastic fantastic it will be a omega sin omega t plus phi and that is how the curve is looking we said if the first one is cos the second one should be sin and therefore it is a omega sin omega t plus phi a omega is that constant now which is not equivalent to the previous one but it is a constant so in the first case if the amplitude is equal to a in the velocity case the amplitude becomes equal to a omega which i have represented on the right hand side over here okay now let's forget about the word amplitude we'll go to the next one what should be the corresponding equation for the acceleration yes please do it the second derivative of x acceleration is d squared x by dt squared so if you know dx by dt is a omega cos omega t plus phi differentiate it once again in your head without using any paper pencil and tell the acceleration yeah quickly i'm sure you are aware of these a omega square cos omega t plus phi Minus a omega squared cos omega t plus phi. Sine the differentiation. Okay, so cos to sine, sine to cos. So therefore, you will get a minus sine, and its uh, thing constant quantity will be a omega squared sine omega t plus phi. And that is what is represented in these three graphs. If you are looking at the mathematical statement and the graph, it is matching very well. So you are correct. but i want you to do it with a spreadsheet to be confirmed that yes it is 
So here we are seeing that it is repeating and it is sinusoidal. And therefore, this oscillator, we can happily call it as harmonic oscillator because it is sinusoidal. And we can also call it a simple harmonic oscillator because it has only one frequency. And that frequency, we are representing it by omega. So these are all simple harmonic oscillators. And since we get the equation by using Newton's laws of motion, we also call it as a classical oscillator. Okay, now look at this. If you look out all around you, this type of motion is there everywhere. It's just for you to observe and see that, yes, oscillations are there all around me. These are some thing work people are doing. And just watch how the movement is. The painter is moving the rolling pin, painting the wall. Is this motion oscillation? Drilling machine. Yes, ma'am. So everywhere in your day-to-day -day life, you are observing this type of motion, knowingly or unknowingly, and you will realize that all of them are satisfying whatever we've been discussing now. So what is the property of these oscillations? All of them, if you look at it, is going from the midpoint to some distance. It is taking a turn and coming back to the midpoint, going on the other side to some distance, and then taking a turn and coming back. And if you look at it carefully, you will find that the distance where it is turning around is equal on either side. Uh, excuse me, madam. And, uh, pardon? Pardon? Uh, uh, excuse me, madam. Yes, uh, yes. The, the Excel sheet is not visible to uh, participants, I think. No, I'm, I'm not showing the Excel sheet, sir. I'm showing only the PPT. Okay. I have not yet opened the Excel sheet. Can they see the PPT? Yes, yes. Yeah, if you can see the PPT, I will come to the Excel a little thing. I okay. want to give a little bit of introduction. Let them become aware of what they want to do. Once they know what they are looking at, for looking at, then it will be easier for them to use the Excel sheet. That is why I'm delaying it for a little time. Okay. I will okay. show a few slides and then I will go ahead. Okay? Yes, sir? Okay. Right. Okay. So the properties of all these movements are it has an amplitude. And I'm sure all of you know about it. And every each one of them is having a turning point. A turning point is the position where it is changing its direction. And since it is changing its direction... Obviously, it makes sense to tell that at that point, its velocity is equivalent to zero. It was going in the, let us say, right direction. The velocity was gradually decreasing. It became equivalent to zero. Then it took a turn and then it started increasing its velocity from that point. So that point is known as the turning point. And if you realize the turning point in all these cases is equivalent to plus minus a, where A is the maximum displacement from the mean position. And I'm sure you have observed it, so I won't spend much time in asking you. And all of them are having a particular frequency. The angular frequency, if I write the corresponding equation of motion, which I'm not doing it right now, and look at the frequency, I will find that the frequency is equivalent to square root of K by M, which all the students would have done definitely in their first semester. Okay, so I'm not spending much time over here. So the frequency is equivalent to square root of K by M, where M is the mass of that system, which is oscillating. And K is the corresponding spring constant of the spring or all other things which can be equated to a spring having a spring constant. Since the motions are similar, I showed you with the spring mass system, and we know that the spring has a spring constant. All these systems will have a spring constant, which we are representing it as K. Okay. Now, what is typically the other properties that are very clearly visible, we're not visible, but mathematically it can be derived are these. All these classical oscillators can are said to have some energy. Obviously, they will have energy. The very fact that it is moving will tell us that, yes, it has kinetic energy. Otherwise, how is it moving? And the force that is acting upon it, we said that acceleration is 
proportional to the displacement with a negative sign. And what is force? Force is equal to mass into acceleration according to Newton's laws. Therefore, I can say that the force is equal to minus of some constant k into x because acceleration was proportional to x. Therefore, m into acceleration will also be equal to some constant time x with a negative sign. Therefore, the corresponding force that is acting upon these system is equal to minus kx. Now, if there is a force, it should have a potential energy because potential energy is equal to minus df by dx, which all of us know. So if you differentiate, you will find that the corresponding potential energy is equal to half kx squared. So all these oscillations, uh, oscillators are having a potential energy given by half kx squared. Now, if you look at the term, you'll be very uh, sure that u is proportional to x squared. And x squared means it has to be symmetric. Right? So that much we can say that, yes, it has to be symmetric because it is having a term x squared. Now, what is the corresponding energy? Since these are all mechanical systems, it should have both kinetic energy as well as potential energy. We just now said that the potential energy is equal to half k x squared. Since it is moving and if its velocity is equal to V, its kinetic energy must be equal to half mv squared. Therefore, the total energy is equal to half mv squared plus half kx squared. These are all simple things, but I'm just telling it for the sake of waking you up. Once you know what it is, then it will become easier for me to go ahead. Now, look at this system. Is it an oscillator, something similar to the previous one? Yes or no? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I'm showing you a variety of things where this system is existing. This is actually a density meter. You want to find out the density of milk, you can use. This is a density, the digital density meter. With the help of this, you can and the circuitry inside, you can find out what is the density of a liquid. So that is where it is used. So this is again another classical harmonic oscillator. And in all these cases, we saw that the potential energy is equal to half kx squared. So I am now making you imagine before I do the Excel sheet. If I want to plot the potential energy with respect to this uh, thing, displacement, displacement in the x-axis, potential energy in the y-axis, are you sure that you will get a curve like the blue curve that I'm showing you over here? Will you get a curve like this? Yes or no? Yes, ma'am. Yes. And what is this curve known as in mathematics? Parabola. It is a parabola. Right. And should it be a parabola? Yes. Potential energy is equal to a quadratic term. And therefore, it has to be a parallel. Y is equal to AX squared is the general equation of a parabola. Therefore, we should get, mathematically I'm saying, you should get a parabola. And if you are plotting potential energy with respect to displacement, this is the type of curve you will get for all the oscillators that I've shown you. The ones that I've shown you and the ones that I have not shown you will also have a potential energy curve like this. And since it is like a parabola, we generally call it as parabolic potential well. And I'm sure you have heard of this term, parabolic potential well. So uh, this is the parabolic potential L. What else is it showing? It is showing that if the particle has to be moving or oscillating the way it is, it must be having energy. What energy it has? And is there any constraint in the energy? Not really. Suppose I'm giving an example. Suppose you have, suppose the system has an energy equal to E and that E is over here represented by the dotted line. Then the uh, system will move like this from this end to this end Starting from the midpoint, it will go to the right end, then have a point where it is turning around, come back to zero, go on to the left side, turn around, come back to this point, and so on. That is how it can make its movement. If I decrease the energy, then it will come back to some point over here because the energy has decreased. If it, is have lesser, if it has lesser energy, then it should be moving from this point, let us say, up and down like this. So what is the difference between this movement and this movement? Is there a difference? Is there a difference? Please tell me. Once it is moving with an energy, let us say E1, and it is over here, 
then it is moving with an energy lesser than e1 let me call it as e2 and it is moving over here the movement is similar left to right right to left etc but the only difference is that the amplitude has decreased and that become makes it very clear that obviously the amplitude is a function of the energy if the energy decreases the amplitude decreases that means the particle is moving with a smaller amplitude with lesser energy it is moving with a greater amplitude with larger energy is there any maximum energy that the particle can have not really because it can have any energy starting from the ground point or the starting point which is equal into zero it can have any energy all along this because it is a parabola and the parabola is a open symmetric curve there is no end to it there is no limit to it therefore the particle if it is inside a parabolic potential well does not have any limitations to its energy its energy can become anything from zero to infinity and this is what a classical oscillator is it can have any energy if i say that the energy is equal to zero it means it is stationary it's not moving because the moment its energy is equal to zero its amplitude also will become equal to zero and therefore it is not moving but the moment it starts moving it has any energy starting from zero to any value you think will the energy change continuously yes it will con change continuously and it can have anything that you can think of there is no restriction okay now this i want you to do it with a parabolic uh, i'm sorry with a um, what uh, excel sheet so let me see if i can go to the excel sheet and show it to you straight away okay i'm just showing a small thing we have already used the excel sheet and we know how it has to be done so i won't spend much time i'm just showing you what exactly you can do so i said that the harmonic potential is equal to half k x square there i had written u here i have written v don't worry it is symbolic representation talking about the potential so the potential is equal to half k x square now the uh, per, uh, what the uh, k value that is the spring constant depends upon the system i wa i want to find out a general thing behavior for any system so i'm just taking one value which is an indicative value it doesn't say that i'm talking about system 1 or system 2 so just for the sake of clarity i have taken k is equal to 1 it doesn't matter it will not change not change in the sense the nature of the curve will not change and therefore i can take the value anything i have just taken for simplicity k is equal to 1 what is the energy of the particle again i have taken an ad hoc value it really doesn't matter what i take because i want to look at the behavior of the particle and what is happening so i have just chosen that e is equal to 1000 how do i plot now since it is moving about its mean position and it is going equal distances on either side i can take x starting from 0 i can go let us say 1 2 3 4 on the one side and minus 1 2 3 4 on the other side that means this is my midpoint x is equal to 0 it can move on the uh, negative direction it can also move on the positive direction mathematically we tell whether it is left right or up down we are calling one side as positive one side as negative and uh, what how far does it go no i want a general relation therefore i have chosen up to minus 50 plus 50 but you it is up to you to decide up to what distance you want to draw the parabolic curve and therefore i want to find out what is the potential we just now said that the potential is equal to half k x squared so at every point i can find out what the potential will be by using the formula half k k value i had given which is an absolute reference k value in g column third row and then fx uh, x square which is nothing but this equation for this value it is this uh, term x taken for this value it will take this for this value it will take this and so on so you find out the potential and then you can plot a curve i have taken a little more than that after plotting a curve this blue curve is the corresponding potential curve for my situation and it is obviously becoming a parabola therefore it is a parabolic potential the moment you plot this you will get excited because yes it is a parabola 
it is uh, what you are expecting it to be and that will give you the thrill now i have just taken energy is equal into e e, uh, e is equal into 1000 i'm showing you what is happening i'm saying that when energy is equal into 1000 this particle is moving or the system is moving up and down therefore this must be its turning point this must be its, must be its turning point so the corresponding turning point i can actually find out from my uh, graph and this is the value what is the value it looks from the graph it is equal into 45 so i have actually calculated the potential thing turning point and checked it whether it is correct or not and my calculation says that the amplitude is also equal into 45 so graphically whatever you are getting your calculated value is also the same how will you calculate i just now mentioned that when the particle is moving like this and turning around the potential energy at this point is equal to 0 therefore it can have only kinetic energy uh, i'm sorry its kinetic energy is equal to 0 i'm sorry therefore it should have only potential energy and potential energy at this point will be equal to half k a squared because your x is equal to plus minus a so if i equate the total energy to half k a squared i will get the relation between a and energy and what will the relation be amplitude will be equal to square root of i have written it over here 2 times square root of 2 times the energy divided by k uh, if i had written as uh, sir was suggesting instead of writing dollar g dollar 4 i could have also written over here defined the names over here written the spring constant and the corresponding energy it would have been better but i have not done it you can do it and then see that the amplitude is matching with your graphical value and it tells you that yes the theoretical value and the graphical value are exactly identical what else does it show actually your excel tells you much more much more than what you are seeing now i'm just changing the value of e suppose instead of 1000 the energy of that system is equal to 800 780 just watch the graph you have already what happened did you did it move i didn't see yes it moved from 1000 it came down so its energy is equal to now 780 therefore the graph which was at 1000 line is now at 780 and that you can also see that the amplitude has correspondingly decreased and it has become from 45 to 39 what else does the graph show is something very interesting whenever it has a particular energy e it has to be inside the potential well because the turning point is the limit beyond the turning point it cannot go in fact you have seen in all of them depending upon the energy it is going to one side stopping and turning around it cannot go for with that energy it cannot go any further beyond that turning point similarly over here the particle has to be oscillating between these two points it cannot go any further since it cannot go any further why it cannot go any further because this is like a potential hill there is a potential which is much greater than its own energy so it is not able to climb over the potential hill and therefore it is unable to go so it will not be present outside therefore its energy outside has to be equal to zero and this region on the right hand side beyond the potential is known as the forbidden region so there is a forbidden region on the left hand side there is also a forbidden region in the right hand side what is the meaning of uh, forbidden region it is that region where it the uh, oscillator cannot be present therefore if i go hunting for the oscillator it is essential that i have to look for the oscillator inside the potential well not outside it and that outside region is forbidden for it that is what you are seeing over here that this gray um, brown line is inside the potential well and it is not there outside this i should not have drawn but i am drawing it just to make it clear to you that its total energy is equal to 0 it is not possible for it to be over here it is only uh, thing confined to the potential well you can do much more i've just shown you a little bit but whatever you are seeing about the classical oscillator you can actually see its uh, significance by uh, plotting graphs and doing things on your uh, thing uh, what uh, excel sheet directly instead of writing an mathematical equation something that uh, you have learnt it 
from the textbook and trying to memorize okay so i hope you will use it little later uh, okay now i have come back to my ppt uh, as i was telling look at the monkey it is going up to this point then it is going up to this point therefore over here it is a forbidden region on this side it is forbidden region i have derived that equation total energy at the turning point should be equal to this much therefore the uh, amplitude must be equal to square root of 2 times c e divided by k which i showed you just now and i also mentioned about the forbidden region it is beyond the turning points there is a forbidden region okay and that is true for all classical oscillators that i was showing you pictures now what is so important about a simple harmonic oscillator why should we learn about the simple harmonic moser if it, as sir was uh, telling you before that simple harmonic oscillator everything that you are learning you have any problem you go back to a simple harmonic oscillator and try to see if there is any problem with what you are studying with respect to the simple harmonic moser therefore simple harmonic motion or the oscillator must be a very very important one this is one of its major reasons why it is so important if i am taking a spring constant it moves up and down about its mean position if you look at this it is giving rise to a corresponding curve which is similar to what you have studied it in your class 9 10 11 everywhere yes anybody pardon it is looking it is looking like a sin theta okay sin theta does it look like a wave yes ma'am wave wave yes it looks like a wave so the simple harmonic oscillator is actually a building block for a wave that is why it is so very important because we know that energy is in the form of a wave so everything that you are looking around you are looking at waves only so if this is the building block obviously it is the most important thing when you are talking about houses of different types the building block is the brick so it is very very important because without the brick it would not be there the house would not be there it's something like that without the oscillator wave should not will not be there and therefore it is so very very important okay and all these oscillators have all same property there are two very important similar property and this is linearity and time translation invariance i really do not want to spend too much of time on this but it is very very crucial that all these oscillators are linear and they have a time time translation invariance now what is exactly linear and time uh, translation invariance let me skip it for the time being now these two properties are very evident th by themselves but they are extremely i think important when they are together and that is why an oscillator is so very important because both these properties are present in an oscillator whether these oscillators are having these properties all the while or not is a big question mark you will realize it that it is true when the oscillations are very small so now i am sure you have understood why when you are doing a, a simple pendulum experiment or a bar pendulum experiment or any such oscillation experiment your teacher constantly think uh, keeps you reminded that yes your oscillations have to be small your oscillations have to be small these properties are very very clearly evident only when the oscillations are small and therefore you need to keep the oscillation small if you are trying to study the oscillator okay now let's look at this picture what is this it is an oxygen molecule consisting of two oxygen atoms and what is happening it is moving moving left right left right left right each one of them is it an oscillator of the previous type yes or no we saw a tuning tuning fork isn't it something behaving like a tuning fork each one of them is moving about its mean position left right left right the left molecular atom is moving the right atom is also moving and it feels as if there is a spring attached to these two atoms and that spring is getting extended and compressed alternately so it is something like a spring mass system only and therefore it is having a 
motion similar to that of a spring mass system and the number that is flashing on the top is nothing but its angular frequency an oxygen molecule has a wave number which is nothing but an angular frequency in a different format is equivalent to 1642 and therefore it must be an oscillator like everything else i'm just showing you another molecule this is a water molecule okay what is this motion like i'm feeling sorry you are not answering i wish you were in front of me so that you i look at you and you will answer yeah is this is there some similarity between the two or is is it totally different they are similar ma'am they are similar but the only difference is it doesn't have just one type of motion it is having three types of motion but each of these motion is again a oscillator a, a thing it is an oscillation and therefore since it has three different types of motion it is showing three different frequencies but the three frequencies are independent of each other it's not that one motion is having three frequencies then it would not be a simple harmonic motion it is having one type of motion having one frequency another type of motion having another frequency third type of motion is having a third frequency so each one of them is a simple harmonic motion so we this is complicated water molecule so we will go back to oxygen molecule and we will now look at something else it's not an oxygen molecule here there are two atoms one atom is smaller than the other one again both of them form a molecule let us say it is a a uh, thing molecule made up of two atoms where the two atoms do not have the same mass they are also moving with respect to each other about a mean position the big ball is moving about its mean position right and left the green ball is also moving about its mean position right and left is it a simple harmonic motion yes or no yes yes it is very much a simple harmonic motion so the vibrations of a diatomic molecule is similar to that of a classical oscillator that we have been studying till now okay we saw what are the properties how it is etc turning point forbidden region energy can move continuously from zero to infinity all these uh, factors about the classical oscillator we discussed now in this case since it is looking like any one of the previous oscillators it should behave in the same uh, manner okay but unfortunately we find that it has a um, size very 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 small compared to the all the masses that i am talking about previously the um, uh, monkey if it has some mass which is definitely a mass that is measurable and huge the frog was having some mass the red uh, mass that was kept over there near the spring was definitely having a huge mass which could be measurable and so on the only difference that i am just making you aware though i have shown you a fact picture is for a molecule and a molecule is extremely small compared to those masses that we saw previously that is the only difference that you can see between the previous oscillators and this oscillator otherwise it looks as if it is moving similar to the previous one but when you try to apply the classical laws for these molecules you will find or the atoms or the electrons which is making up these molecules you will find that it is not applicable you cannot use the classical laws and therefore the energy is totally different or given by a different way as compared to the classical oscillators that we were looking at it i'll just show you what it is and then we will go to the excel sheet okay before i do that let me now go uh, i said that the potential energy was containing or was equal to half k x squared in the previous cases therefore it was symmetrical and hence it had a parabolic uh, thing nature it is a parabolic potential well but in reality when we are talking about oscillators which is not exactly giving a symmetrical motion about its mean position we find that the potential is not a perfect uh, parabola there could be some deviation if the potential energy is not just half k x squared but it has some other term x cubed etc then its potential energy curve will not be a parabolic curve if it has a term x cubed then it will be deviated from the parabola and this would be the corresponding 
curve that you would get for the potential energy with respect to distance. In fact, this is a curve of those molecules, dimolecule, diatomic molecules that I was showing. This would be the nature of the curve. Therefore, we can say that it is not a harmonic oscillator, but an anharmonic oscillator deviated from the previous case. Okay. But if you look at the curve at the bottom, where, where two is written, if you look at the bottom, this part, can I continue to call it as a parabolic potential? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. No. Yeah. Yes, it is because this part is fairly symmetrical. And this is looking exactly like what I was showing you previously. Therefore, this part of the curve, I can call it still a parabolic potential, though there is a deviation over here. So when I'm talking about an atom, and if that atom or molecule is somewhere over here, having an energy somewhere confined to this region, then we can consider it to be a harmonic oscillator. If it is over here, then we have to take care of the anharmonicity. Okay, I wish I had shown you that. I forgot to show you. Uh, I will sh no, show you later on. I will not show you. In the Excel sheet, I had plotted, but I have uh, forgot about it. I'm sorry. I don't want to go back now. So we'll go. Now, look at this diatomic molecule. If I consider the motion of one of these small uh, atoms with respect to the other, then this is how it is moving. And the energy that it has is somewhere over here, let us say then it is also moving like what I have shown you before. It is going up and down about its mean position, going left, going right, having a turning point at one particular value, let us say energy E3. Okay, so this is looking like something like the previous oscillator. I can't see the difference. Therefore, its potential energy in this region should be given by half kx squared because it's Energy is low. It is always in this region. And therefore, the potential energy can be written as half kx squared. So whether it is a tiny molecule or if it is a massive particle like the block in the spring, both of them have the similar potential, which is parabolic. And its value is equal to half kx squared. Having kept that in mind, what happens to the total energy? I told you that the classical particle is having a total energy equivalent to half mv squared plus half kx squared. And that energy can change continuously from zero to infinity. Is it applicable for a harmonic oscillator, which is as small as an atom or a molecule? Now, that is what is a big question for me. I'm not giving an answer. In fact, I will say I don't know the answer. So if I don't know the answer, can I use the Excel sheet and find out what is my answer? Is it identical to my classical particle or not? What more? These particles, because they do not satisfy the classical laws, are known as quantum oscillators. And since you cannot use the classical uh, thing laws over here, we will have to use something else to actually find out what is its energy. Energy is the most important uh, thing property that I'm looking for. And therefore, I will say I need to find out its energy. If I want to find out its energy, should that energy be similar to a classical particle? If not, how different it is? And if it is a thing, if the energy is known, what is the corresponding status of that part uh, system or the state of that system, which we can call it or by find it out by knowing how it is behaving? Let me just remind you that if the particle is very small, then we have all learned that according to de Broglie's theory, it is associated with a wave. It has a wave nature. And therefore, if I'm going to find out about its energy uh, to know its state, I need to find out its corresponding wave function. So those are the terms that we must be clear about before we go ahead with the uh, Excel sheet. So a uh, particle, which is a quantum particle, will have some energy. Let me call that energy is equal to E. And this energy can be studied with respect to its status, which is given by its wave function. In quantum physics, we call these quantities as eigenvalues and eigenfunction. Energy is the eigenvalue, and the corresponding function is known as the eigenfunction. Even if you are not aware, doesn't matter. Just remember for this time being. Now, what does quantum oscillators uh, thing behave? Or how do they behave? They follow the quantum rules. They have to follow the quantum rules. That is why they are known as the 
quantum oscillators. So if you look at the quantum rules carefully, these are some statements which are given in that quantum physics. But I do not know whether I will be able to satisfy these conditions with my diatomic molecule, which I have to show you the Excel sheet. Now we know that bound state should have discrete energy and each of these states will have a corresponding eigen functions should be stationary states. We have learned in Bohr's theory that in the hydrogen, the electrons are having some definite energy and some other definite energy. They don't have any energy between it. it therefore, they are called discrete. And each of these energy states are stationary. Therefore, they are known as the stationary states. And what are the other boundary conditions that we must know? I just now show you that if it is having a parabolic potential, classical as well as the quantum oscillators have, they have to be confined inside the potential well. They can't get out of the potential well. The outside is the region. They can't get out of it. So if that's so, if I increase my x to the positive x direction or the negative x direction to minus infinity or infinity, will happen to the wave function. That wave function I'm simply representing in psi and I, x is the displacement. If I move the particle or if I look at the sure, sir, sure. Okay. function must tend to zero. Okay, This is one of the boundary conditions which is very important. And if I can find out the wave function, what should be the nature of the wave function and its derivatives? The, if psi is the corresponding wave function, then d psi by dx, if it is moving in the x direction, will be its first derivative. d squared psi by dx squared will be its second derivative. I'm telling you all this to make a base so that you remember what you are doing, how you are doing, then you will be able to use the Excel sheet. Okay. Now, according to quantum physics, it is necessary that these functions should be continuous, single valued and square integrable. I'm uh, sorry for children who have not studied quantum physics. These terms will uh, think, sound like uh, Greek and Latin. But just uh, take these words, uh, terms for its uh, face value. We, I will show you what exactly it means in the Excel sheet. Okay. So it is necessary that the wave function should be continuous. It should be single valued and it should be square integrable. Okay, these are what is known as the bonds interpretation. So now I think I have told enough. I will now tell you what are the corresponding wave equations that we can write for a quantum particle. Then we will go to the Excel sheet. Now, unlike the classical particle, we cannot use Newton's laws. I mentioned it before. And therefore, quantum physics shows to us that the corresponding wave equation should be written in the form of an equation which is known as the Schrodinger's equation. What is Schrodinger's equation like? Those of you who have learned quantum physics would have realized that this is the Schrodinger's equation. Those of you who haven't done it, don't worry. Just look at this equation. It is equal into minus h cross squared by 2m d squared psi by dx squared plus v psi where v is the potential should be equal into e psi. So obviously it is a second degree equation. If I am able to value, put the value of V and solve this equation, I should be able to find out E if I know Psi or I can find out Psi if I know E. So I will do a, a what the standard trick to be able to find out the wave functions and the corresponding energies. If you have already done this in the classroom, you would realize that the potential is written as a half k access word. <coughs> Since, since omega is equal to square root of k by m, I can write k as m omega squared, substitute this potential into this equation and try to solve it. So when I substitute, I get this equation. Now the equation is becoming difficult and more difficult each time I'm doing the substitution. There is no standard solution for it like you have done it till today. You would have done a second degree equation, write it in a standard format and then simplify it and find out, solve it or find out y, d squared y by dx squared. Here, similarly, I want to find out the value of psi by knowing the value of e or substituting some value of e. If I want to do this in your classroom, even if you are a BSc student and have done the thing and the solution in the class, you will find that your teacher very conveniently 
tells you only but does not derive because the derivation is fairly difficult it is completely says this that the energy of this particle should be equivalent to n plus half h cross omega where h is the planck's constant omega is the frequency n is just a number it is an integer and that integer can be equivalent to 0 1 2 3 after saying this immediately she or he will tell you that since this is an integer energy is dependent upon an integer therefore only it can have an uh, value e when n is equal to 0 it cannot have any value when n is equal to 0.1 or 0.2 it will again have some value at n is equal to 1 some other value at n is equal to 2 and therefore the energy is discrete discrete means either this or this or this or this it can't be anything in between that so since the solution gives me an energy equal to this where n is equal to 0 1 2 3 it has to be discrete i am not convinced okay secondly the teacher will also tell you that the wave function if you solve it painstakingly somehow you will find that the wave equation will look like this a complex uh, term i am not going to read it but it has something over here which looks like it is a constant for a particular oscillator having omega but it depends upon n therefore it is going to change when n changes but otherwise it looks like as if it is the amplitude of a wave equation it has some other term over here which is known as the hermite polynomial the meaning of that i do not know you might have been told something saying that this is a hermite polynomial but what it means i do not know it has another third term over here which is looking like a gaussian term e to the power minus something square divided by 2 so it is something having a gaussian term and that's all what it actually means i am unaware of it so i want to study all this using my spreadsheet i'm giving so much of emphasis because all that i have understood of these equations and terms and expressions was everything with the help of a spreadsheet therefore i adore spreadsheet because it gives me so much of knowledge which i am unable to get from mathematical equations till probably i understood this i had simply learned it by heart because i could also go and reproduce this equation on the blackboard and teach my children that this is my equation this should be the energy of a quantum harmonic oscillator so we will go to the spreadsheet and try to understand now as i told you this equation that i am showing you over here is a second degree equation i am unable to solve it easily not that i can't can't do it but it will take me as together to be able to do even if i am able to solve it i will not understand the meaning of these of these steps it will be totally uh, sort of blinding excepting that i am doing some mathematical equations to find out the solution so therefore the well, second degree equation i need to solve it somehow can i solve it with the excel sheet yes i want to do that and then tell you that yes it is possible for solving any equations in the excel sheet sir has made it very clear that it has to be a numerical analysis so if you are doing by numerical methods you have to use fundamental rules of numerical uh, rules and therefore over here a second degree equation can be done using a ranga range kutta method i'm not sure whether you have heard of it so even if you have not heard just go through it this is these are some things which you are doing in your mathematical cl maths maths classes and i'm sure you would have used it somewhere even if you have not used i'm giving you the formulas these are the corresponding formulas which you have to use in order to solve equation a range kutta method is solving a differential equation i want to find i have an equation dy by dx is equal to something i want to find out why and that i can use by numerical analysis using my excel of course because it will require a long number of calculations but for solving that i will require four constants which are known as the range kutta coefficients k1 k2 k3 k4 i'm just giving you the formulas because i don't want to spend much time in how i got it this is how it is because it is a second degree equation i need another four more constants and those i'm calling it as m1 m2 m3 m4 if you look at these constants how they are k1 is equal to psi dash k2 is equal to psi dash plus m1 h by 2 where h is known as the step size then m1 is equal to here m1 is used for finding out k2 then m1 is equal to that second degree equation that i have showed you over there x double dash 
M2 is equal to this whole quantity plus K1 H by 2. That means for finding out M2, I need the knowledge of K1. For finding out K2, I need the knowledge of M1. For finding out K3, I need the knowledge of M2. For finding out M3, I need the knowledge of K2. The All these coefficients are sort of tangled, inter, entangled within each other. So it is not possible for you to write all the four coefficients, K1, K2, K3, K4, then go to M1, M2, M3, M4. It's not possible. You need to find out K1, M1, K2, M2, K3, M3, K4, M4. I'll show it to you in my Excel sheet. Okay. If these are all theory that I'm taking from the textbook and I'm showing it to you, in Excel sheet, how it was got easily, I want to then show it to you. So just for the sake of knowledge, let me tell you, quantum harmonic oscillator has so many different states. For n is equal to 0, it looks like this. For n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, n is equal to 3, n is equal to 4 and so on. And if it is inside the parabolic potential, it is symmetric about its mean position. And this is how the wave functions look like. So what is the thing? What else do we see over here? As the principal quantum number, n is known as the principal quantum number. As the principal quantum number increases, the wave function alternates between odd and even functions. The textbook says that. Now, this is an even function. It is symmetric about its main position. This is an odd function. This is even function. This is odd function. This is even function. Why should it be like this? I don't know. The wave functions are penetrating the forbidden region. I told you that the particle should be completely inside the potential well in the classical case. In this case, I'm seeing that the potential well stop is over here. There is a boundary over here. But in spite of that, the wave is coming over here and then becoming equal to zero. It is extending a little beyond that. So therefore, the wave functions are penetrating the forbidden region. Why is it like this? How is it? Why it is like this and how it is like that? We will try to find out. What else does it say? Energy is discrete about the energy levels and are evenly spaced. That means it can have this dotted line energy E at n is equal to 0. It can have at n is equal to 1. It can have at n is equal to 2. It cannot have anything in between it. Why? I don't know. And the best part of it, we said that the classical particle can have zero energy. But in this case, the first energy is over here, while zero would be over here. Therefore, the lowest possible energy is not zero. It is non-zero. And that lowest energy, I will show it to you, is half h cross omega. It cannot be zero. Why this difference? Why in a classical particle it can have zero energy? Why a quantum oscillator cannot have zero energy? Let's look at it. And the smallest energy quantum number between two states is always equal to h cross. That means the difference between this and this is h cross omega. Difference between this and this is equal to h cross omega and it is a constant. So all this I want to want you to realize from your Excel sheet. Okay. And another last final thing is when I had the monkey oscillating, the mon monkey was going from the midpoint to the uh, thing edge. Then it was turning around and coming back. Then it was going to the right extreme end. It was turning around and it was coming back. Don't you think it is spending more time at the edges compared to the center? Yes or no? If I want to catch the monkey while it is oscillating, which is the best strategy? Should you try to catch the monkey at the center or should you try to catch the monkey at the edges? At the turning points. Answer please. It will be at the turning points. Which means to say that it is spending more time at the turning points as compared to the center. So that we say in the probability density of a classical oscillator is like the dotted line that I am showing you over here. So it is high over here at the turning point. It becomes low and almost constant at the center, again it becomes equal to high. If you look at the probability density of a quantum particle or the quantum oscillator, you will find that it is not like a smooth curve like this. It is up and down, up and down, up and down, telling that it has maximum probability over here, zero probability over here, maximum probability over here, zero probability over here and so on. Theory says that and I will show you later on. 
and but if you look at the curve general average value it is fairly matching the classical thing so we say that the probability density when n is large let us say 12 is fairly similar to that of a classical oscillator not when n is equal to 1 2 3 i'll show you that also in the excel sheet okay so if you are looking at n is equal to 100 in our excel sheet you will find that it is something like this okay now i will go back to my excel sheet what is the time sir bapre god bless me i'll take another half an hour please pardon me i'm just showing it to you okay now what i have done let me show you but i don't think i can spend much time in that i first calculated in my excel sheet k1 m1 k2 m2 k3 m3 etc etc then i calculated the wave function the wave function can be found out yes sir yes sir अच्छा ये एक्सेल शीट आपको दिखता है कि नहीं ओके थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू वेरी मच बट कैन यू सी माय एक्सेल शीट यस ओके फैंटास्टिक ओके देन आई विल टेक सम टाइम ओके ना बिकॉज दिस इज द मेन थिंग ऑल दिस आई वाज टेलिंग वाज वर्ड प्रोलॉग बिफोर दैट okay now the wave function is calculated using these coefficients there is a standard formula by the way help of which you can find out the first derivative of the wave function also you can find out like how we did right do the one calculation drag it and you will get all points so i'm just showing it to you how it has been done can you see those numbers over there what else have i done i have also found out uh the potential curve x i have changed i have taken from minus 6 to plus 6 and the corresponding potential energy is also i have calculated and i have plotted a graph between psi and x and in the same graph i have plotted a uh, thing once again v and x that means i am having both the potential curve as well as the wave function and another place i have calculated or i have plotted what happened i have plotted psi dash with respect to x the first derivative and if you remember i told you that quantum particles will behave in a particular fashion and the wave equation should be such that it should be continuous it should be single valued as well as square integrable only those wave functions are allowed all other wave functions are useless they have no meaning so that is why i am explaining to you why i have plotted all these quantities and i will show you now the plot okay now for plotting i had to take some value of energy so i have written over here what is the energy that i have taken so the my energy is equal to 2.5 which into the energy units h cross omega since h cross omega is just the energy unit i am not showing that i am taking the numerical value so the numerical value is equal to 2.5 means n is equal to 2 and the energy should be equal to n plus half therefore it is 2.5 under this situation you will look at the left curve which is probability versus density and uh, versus den uh, distance i'm sorry not density a probability density versus distance and this curve is a wave function this brown curve is the wave function and the blue curve is the potential well okay now i want to show you for my energy equal to 2.5 the wave function is this brown wave that means it is there inside the potential well it is a curve which is going up and down having a maximum and a minimum and outside the curve also it is existing but as i go outside far and far away if i move from x is equal to 5 6 7 8 9 10 and so on i will find that this wave function is tending towards zero or it is asymptotically decreasing which is satisfying my condition when x is equal to plus minus infinity the wave function should become equal to 10 to 0 and it is tending therefore it is tending towards zero at positive infinity it is also tending towards zero at negative infinity and it is existing inside the potential well therefore this wave function should be allowed should be meaningful 
should satisfy or is satisfying all the quantum rules that is required for you to give rise to a wave function. If I look at the probability density versus distance, which is nothing but psi square. If I have plotted over here psi squared, look at this psi into psi with respect to position, then it shows the existence of the particle. I have not drawn the po potential well. It shows that it is having probability density distribution like that. It has maximum, minimum, maximum, minimum, maximum inside the potential well. The potential well is somewhere over here. You can see over here. So it is inside over here. Therefore, this is how the potential well, I'm sorry, the probability density curve looks. Okay. Now, this is very interesting that it is a satisfactory wave function. Now, I said I have chosen 2.5. What if I take this energy to be equivalent to 2.51? I'm sorry. What's happening? It's not operating. What happened? Unsupported features. There are some features in your workbook that we cannot show in the browser. Read only the workbook has opened in. Oh, no, God. Read only mode. Uh, sir, can you see this uh, things? Huh. Sir, can you see this Excel sheet? It is, it is visible? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, okay, I think some uh, something happened. I'm showing it over here. If the energy is equivalent to 2.5, I showed you how the curve looks. And I said that it is a very uh, useful wave function, which has a lot of meaning. It has some probability density and of existence inside the potential well. Now, if I change this, what happened? Why it is behaving like this? Which browser you are using, ma'am? Uh, sir. Uh, Which browser you are using? Just a minute. Why it is not writing and not? Huh. Huh. What does it say? What can I do? Uh, I'll just close it and open once again, sir. Uh, PPT, I'm closing. All, all things I'm closing. I will restart only Excel. What? You are presenting to everyone. So what does it have? What's happening, sir? And I'm at the soup. Okay. Once again, open Google, ma'am. Uh, sorry, not Google, Excel. Excel, please again open that. Yeah. I'm trying to open, sir. Is it visible now? No, not yet. Is it uh, there on your screen? It is there on my screen, but uh, you are presenting to everyone. Sir, I'll close this also. No, no, no we are closing it. Actually, you are showing... The uh -huh. Google feed part, not that part. You have to show, show and go on that window, actually. Uh, I, I am on this window. Uh, Ma'am, stop presenting and present again, uh, uh, I think, the whole window and open the Excel then. Okay. I have now stopped sharing. Then I will go to that. Okay. Present again. Present again. Uh, the whole screen. Present select, now. Whole, select whole screen. Select whole screen. Jo up uh, on the Nein, monitor. Present now. Nahi karna hai. Uh, then you have to select first which what you have to present. Hmm. No, present now. Karna hai, ma'am. Karna. Abhi ye khola. Fir present now. Karna hai. Yes. Now we are in that screen. Tire. Every time I'm having some problem. Chit. Show. What will I share? I will first share. Now open Excel now. Now open Excel. Now I open Excel. Okay. Now is it visible? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Oh, my God. That's okay. 
hide this. Okay. Now, <laughs> I'm sorry for all this disturbances. I'm an absolute fool. So, the energy when it is 2.5, I want to change it to 2.51. Did you see what happened to the wave function? The potential energy came, nothing happened. It remained as it is. But when I changed the energy from 2.5 to 2.51, can you see the wave function? The brown color curve is pointing downwards. It is not becoming asymptotically zero. That means when X keeps on increasing, on the right hand side, this brown curve will keep on increasing. And on the left hand side, this brown curve will also be keep, will keep on increasing. Is it allowed according to your quantum rules? Can the wave function exist or can the probability density of that corresponding uh, system exist beyond as x keeps on increasing towards plus minus infinity? I'm showing you the probability density curve also. Previously, it was asymptotically becoming equal, uh, tending towards zero. Now it has curved up which tells you that this wave function is not allowed. That means if the energy was 2.5, exactly satisfying your energy formula n plus half h cross omega, then it was an allowed function. But the moment I increase this energy slightly from 2.5 to 2.51, this wave function is not allowed. Since the wave function is not allowed, obviously it cannot, or this uh, thing, energy does not have any meaning. And hence, I cannot have a particle, quantum particle, oscillating with an energy slightly more than 2.5. Let us try it once again with some energy slightly less than 2.5. Suppose I make it 2.49. 2.49 is also smaller than 2.5. So if I moment I do enter, you can see that the wave function is not decreasing as x increases towards plus infinity or minus infinity. Therefore, this wave function is not allowed. Am I clear? Okay. Now, I said that the energy, I made it as 2.49, 2.5, 2.51. What if I increase it very small amount? Let me say it is equivalent to 4.999. Okay. I will again try to find out. 99 is probably a little too small. 2.499. Okay. Not going. I'm going to the wrong place and doing. Can you see that it is increasing slightly? Since I've made the curves fairly fat, you can see as if it is touching the x-axis. It is really not touching the x-axis. And you can see that small curve which is going up. I will do it once again. 2.5. Now it is like this. I'll make it 2.499. Can you see the difference? I hope you can see the difference. So even a small increase in its energy is not possible for the wave function to have any physical meaning. And therefore that wave function is not allowed. So therefore it can have an energy 2.5. Nothing lesser, nothing more. But if that is so, then I should say it has only one particular energy. No, let me try some other energy. Suppose I make the energy equal to 1.5. Is that allowed? Now, please tell me whether it is allowed or not. Look at the wave function. The wave function is existing inside the potential well. But again, it is becoming asymptotically zero towards plus and minus x-axis uh, infinity. And therefore, is this wave function allowed or not? Yes? No answer. I think probably you are not able to understand. I am saying that I am giving some energy to my quantum oscillator and checking whether it is having a particular wave function which is satisfactory or not. If it is satisfactory, then it is allowed. If it is not satisfactory, it is not allowed. So this particular wave function is allowed because it is going towards zero as x becomes plus minus infinity. So if it is 2.5, it is allowed. If it is 1.5, it is also allowed. Again, I will just show it to you. 1.502, let us say a small value more than 1.5. Is that allowed? Look at that. Is it allowed? No. Because it is not satisfying the condition that it should become equal to zero when x is equal to plus minus infinity. Therefore, this is not allowed. 
So can I just try 0.5? Well, it is 0.5, n is equal to 0. Is it allowed? Yes or no? You are not seeing the excitement that I am seeing. That it is also allowed because it is asymptotically going towards 0 when x is equal to plus minus infinity. So point 0 0.5 was allowed, 1.5 was allowed, 2.5 was allowed. You can play with it and see that all these values which is satisfying n plus half will give you a proper wave function and therefore it is allowed. Any other energy slightly lesser or slightly more than that or more uh, le lesser and more uh, thing than that will not be allowed. So only those energies which are satisfying n plus half h cross omega are having allowed wave functions and therefore it is a allowed wave function means those energies are allowed and if you look at it carefully you will find 0 0.5 has n is equal to 0, 1.5 is equal to n is equal to 1, 2.5 n is equal to 2, 3.5 n is equal to 3 and so on. So only for integers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 those energies are allowed, all others are not allowed. In addition to that, what else do we see? I just want you to watch. When I took zero energy equal to 0 0.5, I found that at the center x is equal to 0, the wave function was maximum. And on either side, it was symmetrical, but it was going down. That means it is having maximum probability density. Look at the probability density curve. It is having maximum probability at the center, x is equal to 0, and its probability density is gradually decreasing on either side. Does this wave function have any nodes? Nodes are those points where the wave function is touching the x-axis. Since this is asymptotically 0, though I have drawn it a thick line, it is not touching the x-axis. Therefore, it does not have a node on the positive side. It does not have a node on the negative side. So for energy n is uh, 0 0.5, there are no nodes for the wave function. It has maximum probability at the center and it is symmetrical. Okay. Now, if I consider this 1.5, I said 1.5 was an allowed energy. So if I consider the energy as 1.5, look at the wave function. It is having some properties which is dissimilar to the previous one. At this position, x is equal to 0, the probability density is equal to minimum. Look at the probability density. It is having minimum, while in the previous case, you had maximum. So that is also possible. When n is equal to 0, it was maximum. For n is equal to 1, it is minimum. But is it an allowed function? Yes, it is an allowed function because it is tending towards 0 as x is equal to plus minus infinity. What is the no, number of nodes over here? It has only one node. Therefore, for energy equal to 1.5, n is equal to 1 and it has only one node. When the energy was equal to 0 0.5, it had no nodes because n was equal to 0. Okay. Can you have node? Or let me show it in another few cases. Then I will uh, tell you generalizing. If I consider the energy equal to 2.5, then again I find that at x is equal to 0, it is having a maxima. And on either side, there is again another maxima and it is a symmetrical wave function. It is an allowed wave function. And uh, look at the number of nodes. There is a node over here. There is a node over here. And therefore, for an energy equal to 2.5, it is having two nodes. I have shown you three cases. I can keep on showing it. Let me probably take 6.5 just to make it clear that if the energy is equal to 6.5, is it an allowed wave function? Yes, it is an allowed wave function. Of course, I can't show you over here the asymptotically decreasing, but you can look at my arrow. This is how it is moving. This is how it is moving. Here I have plotted up to 4 or 5 centimeters or 5 units. And this is going a little further, therefore you cannot see it, but it is an allowed wave function. And when n is equal to 6, you find that as x is equal to 0, you are having a maximum maxima, which means that the probability density is maximum at the center, like n is equal to 0, n is equal to 2, n is equal to 4, n is equal to 6, and so on. So generally you can say whenever n is even at x is equal to 0, there is a maximum probability. And when n is equal to odd, that is 1, 3, 5, 7, etc., 
then the maximum probability at x is equal to 0 is minimum. And that is true for all cases. Okay, so this is one thing. Another thing that you realize it, when I'm talking about n is equal to 6, and if you look at the number of nodes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So when energy is 6.5, it is having 6 nodes. When energy is 5.5, it is having 5 nodes. When energy is 10.5, it is having 10 nodes and so on. You can check it uh, thing for many, many things. So therefore, since the n value is representing the number of nodes, can we have a node which is fractional in a wave function? Can we have, if you look at the standing wave, can you have say that the standing wave is having uh, 10 and a quarter nodes? Can you say like this? Is it possible? Oh no, I think there is total silence. Yes, it is not. The number of nodes have to be only integers. It can't be a fraction. Since this n is giving us the number of nodes, it is very clear that your n has to be an integer. It cannot be a fractional value. So that is one explanation which tells us that the energy which is depending upon n has to be a discrete value. It cannot be anything. n has to be one the integer. It cannot be anything. And that is why the energies are 0 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, 3 discrete values. It cannot have anything in between these values. Hence, the discreteness is definitely depending upon the number of nodes. Okay. Secondly, Whenever n was equal to even, n is equal to 0, 4, 6, 8, cell, we saw that the wave, I will just show it to you for 4, 4.5. You will find that this wave is also allowed and it is symmetrical. So whenever n is equal to even, the wave functions are symmetrical. Whenever n is equal to odd, the wave functions are asymmetrical. And therefore, it tells us about the parity of that particular system. When n is even, it is having what? Even parity. When n is odd, it is having odd parity. I am not sure how many of you have heard of the word parity. But since it is visible to me, I am just telling you that in these cases, quantum harmonic oscillators, for n even, it has even parity. And when n is equal to odd, it is having odd parity. We are looking at the wave function and telling this. We are also seeing each of these time, I have also plotted the wave function as well as the first derivative. I have plotted over here x versus psi dash. You will find that the wave function is continuous and the first derivative is also continuous. So it is satisfying your rules that the wave function should be continuous, it should be single valued and it should be square integrable. Square integrable, I have not told you anything but it is continuous and it is single valued is very clear from these curve. That means at x is equal to 1.5, it has just one value. At x is equal to 0.7, it is having only one value. Therefore, it is single valued. It doesn't have any sharp corners and things like that, which can have two values for a particular value of x. It doesn't have. Therefore, those waves which are continuous and single valued alone are only are the allowed wave functions. What do you mean by square integrable is this. The square integrable means that if you are hunting for that particle, you will be sure that it is going to be there inside the potential well. And if you hunt all over the place, then the probability of finding the particle should be equal to 1. That means if I am looking at a particular wave function psi and see psi squared, integration of psi squared from plus infinity to minus infinity should be equal to 1 because it is giving you the probability density over the entire space. If you have a particle, it has to be somewhere. Okay, so that if I am going to find out the probability density all over the space from plus infinity to minus infinity, it should become equal to 1. That is the meaning of square integrability. If you actually this, the, which actually becomes clear over here, that the probability density has to be finite from plus infinity to minus infinity. And you can change the amplitude to make it equal to 1, which is also known as normalizing the wave function. These terms are a little difficult, difficult 
for children who have never heard about it but for children who have already studied what is uh, quantum harmonic oscillator i am sure they have heard about it and they are able to appreciate it okay uh, when i am talking about these wave functions i am telling you that it has so many nodes so whenever i am talking about nodes obviously between two consecutive nodes there has to be a maxima when i am talking about these wave functions i'm also telling you that they are alternately maxima minima maxima minima some of them are symmetrical some of them are asymmetric that hermite polynomial in that wave equation is actually referring to this it is showing the hermite polynomial will show that it is a polynomial where n gives you the term to the x to the power of n and those terms will be 3 or 5 or 7 if n is equivalent to odd and it will be equivalent to 2 4 6 8 when n is equivalent to even so it clearly shows that those hermite polynomial is telling us that it is having even parity when n is even and odd parity when n is odd okay i'm just making it clear what exactly it means so that is the meaning of those terms i i am uh, thinking because everybody is silent i i understood that i am not sure whether you are understanding what i'm saying acha the most important thing is i have also written over here what is the turning point 3 is the turning point when energy is equal to 4.5 3 is over here so according to our classical theory this is the turning point therefore the probability density outside this should become equal to 0 and it should be existing only within this parabola but here it is shown that at x is equal to 3 the wave function is existing at x is equal to 4 up to 4 maybe up to 4 point something it is existing this fact that it is existing even beyond the potential well is known as tunneling so a quantum oscillator is capable of tunneling while a classical oscillator is does not tunnel it is completely confined to the potential well that difference also i am showing you with this curve you can also see it over here since the turning point is equal to 3 it is existing the probability of the particle existing beyond 3 is there and therefore we say that it is capable of tunneling okay what else if i make this energy extremely large okay now let me tell you since it is having maximum minimum maximum minimum we just now showed that in the potential well if i am drawing the classical probability density it should be something like this it should be maximum at the edges and almost constant at the center and again maximum at the edge if i am looking at the probability density it is not like that for a classical particle it would be like this but for a quantum particle it is showing that it is having maxima minima maxima minima alternately so there is a huge difference especially for n is equal to 0 to 4 you will realize that the classical probability is totally different from that of the quantum probability i'm just showing it to you once again let me say 2.0.5 when i make the energy equal to 0.5 the probability density is maximum for a quantum particle and it is minimum for a classical particle so it is const con contrasting each other that the classical particle is totally different from a quantum particle when n is equal to 0 similarly i can show you for maybe n is equal to 2 it is totally different at for n is equal to 2 again the probability density is maximum at the center minimum again it is maximum on either side but for a classical particle it is maximum at the edges which is so far away and it is like this therefore it does not match when n is equal to 2 0 2 3 4 and so on but if i make this let us say 60.5 is this is this an allowed particle is this an allowed energy i'm sorry yes or no 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 60.5 where n is equal to 60 energy is equal to 60 plus 0.5 which is 60.5 is it allowed or not allowed allowed then it should be allowed it should be allowed. it should be allowed yes so i'm just showing you for 60.5 if you plot the graph you will get like this i have plotted for a small range therefore you cannot see the rest of the curve the curve would be like this 
and the curve would be like this. Okay, so it is an allowed wave function. Uh, I'm not showing you over here. I'll show you elsewhere where I have plotted for a longer distance. Yeah, over here. Please look at the classical particle. Classical particle is like this. Okay, the brown color curve. And the, um, I'm sorry, the quantum particle is like the brown color curve. The classical particle is also like the brown color curve. And therefore, you say that when n is large, 30, 40, 12, I showed you in my paper 12, then there is something called a Bohr's correspondence principle. And both classical and quantum particle behave the same way when n is large. But when the n value is very small, there is a total contrast and you cannot explain classical thing theory with respect to the quantum equations. So that is very clear when I'm trying to show you that the particle or the probability density is matching for Bohr's correspondence principle, but it is not matching uh, for large values of n, but it is not matching when n is equal to small. Okay, so I've told you a couple of things, many things. I'm not sure whether you have understood or not. Okay, now I'm just highlighting those points once more. So a quantum particle has discrete energy, classical particle has continuous energy. Quantum particle has half integers, while classical particle is continuously changing. Quantum particle has zero point energy, which is not equivalent to zero. It is equivalent to half h cross omega. Okay, it was 0 0.5. That means it is half h cross, h cross omega. So it is not equivalent to zero. The turning points were dependent upon energy, both for classical as well as for quantum particle. But n gives us the number of nodes which is equivalent, which is known as the principal quantum number. The phase shift I didn't show you. Energy level diagram I have not uh, max. Okay, I'm not uh, so told you. Maximum at x is equal to zero when for even parity it has minimum at x is equal to zero for odd parity. That means the wave functions are symmetrical and asymmetrical for odd, even and odd. Okay. Uh, I also did not show you this. When I decrease the step size, then you can show even small changes in energy is not allowed. Then, uh, achha, decreases, no, penetration into classical forbidden region, I showed it to you just now. Amplitude, which gives you the integrability, I have not shown you. I can show it to you. Bohr's frequency condition also applies only for large values of n, not for small values of n. So for a quantum particle, there are small ripples at the center, while for classical particle, it is smooth. But both quantum and classical particle, at the edges, the probability density increases for large value of n. Okay. Oh, what else can I show you? Okay. One more thing I will show you and I think I'll stop. 0 0.5 energy I will go because that's the simplest curve. I'm showing you. Look at the energy, I'm sorry, wave function for x is energy equal to 0 0.5, this brown curve, okay? Now I'm saying I am going to make the wave function integrable so that I can simply say psi squared from minus infinity to pi plus infinity should become equal to n, which tells us if you have done the problems in the classroom, you will realize that when you do this, what happens is the amplitude changes. So as the wave function becomes integrable. So here I'm changing the amplitude. If I change the amplitude from 5 to let us say 10, let us see what happens. Look at the wave function. I'm changing the amplitude. Did the nature of the curve change? Did the nature of the curve change? It was maximum at x is equal to 0. Did it become minimum at x is equal to 0? I'm doing it once again. Probably you're not able to realize. You are seeing that the nature of the curve is same. It is like this, bell-shaped. It, it continues to be bell-shaped. So the amplitude, when it changes, the nature of the curve does not change. Therefore, we are permitted to change the amplitude in order to make the wave function square integrable. I'm repeating it once again. From 5, I'm making it, let us say, 15. What happened to the wave? It just became larger, larger in size, which means the amplitude has changed. But the nature of the wave remains the same. 
and all these are possible for you to do it in excel sheet because when you change any number since you have made your equations such that i'm sorry your calculations such that it is linked automatically it changes and therefore you can see the animation from the graph to understand it better okay so this is proving that yes i can make this wave function square integrable by simply changing my amplitude of the wave function okay i'm not sure okay i think uh, i have done most part of it so is there any questions i think it's a fairly difficult thing for children who have not heard of the quantum oscillator we really covered a lot of ground in a very very short time Uh, but i am not sure whether children have understood they i don't think they have understood they should have gone into the excel in fact you know because uh, then maybe uh, but because there was only one hour available so there was no other option yes but then you have 31 children are there but have you understood please answer yes or no at least 10% have you understood at least 10% Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma uh, only Prithviraj is saying yes. yes, ma yes ma okay. Other okay. sir also saying yes. Did yes. yes. you understand twenty percent? How many of you understood twenty percent? Yes, ma'am. How many of you understood twenty percent? How much? How many of you understood fifty percent? No. Okay. Twenty percent is good enough. And thank you very much for listening patiently. extremely grateful to you for having patience for so long thank you so much ma'am it was really very interesting actually you have i mean the whole quantum mechanics was there in one scratch yeah. it was i mean it's such a good resource for teaching actually for yes. actually pg students i think would have understood it better or final year yeah. students do or third year students third year students yes final year students yes, yes. i think uh, it, it was marvelous actually i really enjoyed it thank you so much lovely, lovely uh, how many third bsc children are there in this group 31 students are there how many of you all are third bsc students yes ma'am okay one yes ma'am two yes ma'am three yes ma'am four Achha, have you heard of quantum no, mechanics no, quantum no. oscillator harmonic oscillator quantum yes, harmonic yes, oscillator yes ma'am yes ma'am yes, yes. you will understand better thank you so much thank you so much you are in second year i don't think they have done second year have they done quantum mechanics no no it is just basic of quantum second year i didn't spend much time in the excel sheet for classical thinking that i will spend more time in this anyway doesn't matter something at least you have learned so now you can use when i create your own uh, what excel sheets and do some learning teaching understanding through that Yes sir yes sir Okay good 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 okay thank you very much sir it's a uh, uh, sort of uh, waking them up they will definitely go to next class and then learn so it's good for them that they will learn it
Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, sir, I'm sorry I am interrupting, uh, but I must add on uh, with you that uh, even the first year students must have, must have learned a lot. Uh, the way Madam uh, explained the things, I was really wondering about the, uh, how simply she ha you have explained this quantum mechanics to uh, all the students, all the participants. Thank you, sir. Uh, I was also very impressed, ma'am. Thank you so much. So thank you really so much. Thank you. Uh, I tell the children one more thing. I think uh, it is very important for me to conclude that I showed you what are the differences between classical and quantum oscillator. But the best part is they are not different. Okay. When I'm saying that the classical uh, thing uh, oscillator can have uh, energy continuously from zero, zero to infinity and a quantum uh, oscillator will have only discrete energy, it tries to show that as if they are two different things. No, they are not two different things. It is only a question of how you perceive it. It is like this. If I'm talking about a quantum uh, classical oscillator, it is confined in this potential and uh, thing well. So it can move from zero to anything. So the energy levels, let us say, are so close to each other for the classical particle that you are not able to find out the difference between these two energy levels. Therefore, you are telling it is continuous. On the other hand, when you are talking about a quantum particle, it is again confined in this potential well. The difference between this energy and this energy is measurable because of this factor that Planck's constant is 10 to the power minus 34. And we are measuring with that instrument. Since we are measuring with an instrument which is capable of measuring this gap, you are saying that the energy is discrete for a quantum particle and you are saying your energy is continuous for a classical particle. I'm just giving a layman's example. Suppose I take a glass of water and I ask you, is water continuous? Water is made up of H2O molecules. Is it continuous or discrete? How many of you will say continuous? How many of you will say discrete? Please tell continuous. How many of you are saying it is continuous? Nobody is answering. How many of you are saying it is discrete? Water is discrete or water molecules are discrete and water molecules are continuous. Is one of them wrong? If so, tell me yes or no. Water molecules are continuous. Therefore, water is continuous. Can I say, are you saying yes or no? सुनाई नहीं दिया बेटा थोड़ा प्रॉब्लम है आपका ये में और थोड़ा बोलिए और एक बार बोलिए प्लीज थ्री चीयर्स फॉर नेहा हिपे फोरे सो ही हैज टोल्ड वेरी क्लियरली इट डिपेंड्स अपॉन हाउ यू आर केपेबल ऑफ मेजरिंग इन मैक्रोस्कोपिकली इफ यू वॉन्ट टू सी देन द मॉलिक्यूल्स विल बी डिस्क्रीट there will be some gap and you will be able to see. Probably you have to see a instrument. You have to use an instrument to be able to measure the gap between two molecules. If you can, then you will call it as discrete. But ordinarily, I am not able to separate out one molecule from another. My eyes is not able to measure the change, the difference between them. Therefore, I will say, if I'm using my eyes, I will say it is continuous. If I'm using some other instrument which is capable of measuring the separation, then I will say it is discrete. Exactly the same thing is happening in classical and quantum. In quantum, we are having a measuring device, the measuring quantity, the Planck's constant, because of which we are saying it is discrete. In classical, we can't make out the difference between the energy levels. Therefore, it, as here, it behaves as if it is continuous or it, we say that it is continuous. Okay. Similarly, tunneling. We say that classical particle does not tunnel. 
it is totally confined into the potential well. When we look at a quantum oscillator, we say it is tunneling. Again, the distance through which it tunnels is so very, 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 very small. The percentage of uh, thing, uh, transmission through, due to tunneling is so very small that if you have a po possible instrument to measure it, you will say it is tunneling. If you don't have an instrument, you will say it is not tunneling. In classical uh, physics, we don't have an instrument to say whether the particle is actually existing outside the potential well or not. It is so it small, is so you can't measure it. Therefore, you are saying it is not tunneling. But in quantum physics, because you are capable of measuring this distance through which it is tunneling or the probability of the thing, what percentage of uh, particle which is tunneling, or you can measure, therefore you are saying it is tunneling. That is the difference. So both the oscillators behave in a similar way. How we perceive it depends upon our measuring device. Okay? I hope this you could understand. All of you. Okay. So thanks a lot. If you have any question, please ask. Yes, sir. I'm waiting for you to tell. Okay. I think I must say that you did a wonderful job. <laughs> and uh, there is one question left. Yes. If you had left for me, that why yes. I called it as that uh, harmonic oscillator is a troubleshooter. Trouble yes. <laughs> then I really picked up one word which you are using so often. Can you please switch off your mics? I think we better, I think. Then disturbances will not be there. Uh, so, the the reason I was using that was because you explained it very nicely. You were using the term similar, similar, similar so many times in your lecture. And that is the, that is the essence that Feynman once said when he was actually trying to explain things to people that we are very blessed people. Whenever we find similar things, Fortunately, we have similar solutions. Okay. So, when you were actually plotting that uh, potential energy curve for uh, an harmonic oscillator, there was a small area in which, in some approximation, you could say that it is a harmonic oscillator. So, that means even if when you are talking about a molecule of two atoms, you are in some region, you know, operating with that harmonic oscillator itself. And look at the history of physics. You will find that harmonic oscillator has been a troubleshooter. Who is a troubleshooter, by the way? Can I get some response from the students? You can write it in the chat box. I can see the chat box. Who is a troubleshooter? Anybody? You can even say that. Prithviraj, what do you think? Someone that solves the problem. That solves the problem. This is the essence. Whenever we are, you know, looking for some kind of a mystery around us, we find that harmonic oscillator is one problem which actually unfolds the mystery of that particular problem itself. I'll give you examples. Go to Planck, he talks about harmonic oscillator. Go to Einstein, he talks about harmonic oscillator. And we are talking of what? We are talking of 20th, 20th century in the beginning almost. And ma'am also mentioned in her lecture one very interesting title, Bohr's Correspondence Principle. And that was the time when Bohr was convincing people that if you take in all these calculations H approaching zero, you will find that you will have the classical results available to you. So when we actually make these distinctions, the only distinction is that the area of operation is different. When we are at the micro level, we are talking of uh, the quantum mechanics. But when we are at the macro level, we are talking most of, most of the times uh, classical mechanics. Ma'am also talked about one thing very interesting, you know. She was talking about continuous energy levels and discrete energy levels. What nature does is, when it uh, looks at single single atom separately energy levels look discrete when it tries to be, be, bring them together 
these energy levels start crowding and a continuity actually happens and you actually see the band structure band structure is like a continuum only but the interesting part is whenever there is a gap we say oh this is a very interesting material this thumbprint of this material is very useful for us in technology because semiconductors have changed our lives and this was the kind of understanding which we have really gained over the last 100 years never never in the history of mankind in such a short period we have understood the mysteries of nature nature has been you know very very uh, what you call uh, secretive but thanks to the human intellect and ingenuity of the man that it has been able to unravel that and what we are doing today we are very lucky you know we were born in such a time that we are using computers talking to you aisa to mahabharat ke time pe bolte the ha sab kuch nazar aa raha tha distance pe baithe baithe ab to hum sab kuch dekhte hain so this is uh, something wonderful uh, professor man if you want na there can be one seminar of 6 days on harmonic oscillators only there has there are there is such a variety of problems which have been tackled by harmonic oscillator einstein was talking about solids he had a problem to explain a uh, specific heat of a solid and he said let me imagine solid as nothing but made up of harmonic oscillators uncoupled and then somebody said why uncoupled let me couple it and that is how people try to bring what you call complexities in a simple problem but physics wale bade sadharan hote hain wo pehle simple cheez se shuru karte hain fir dheere dheere usme perturbations dalne shuru karte hain aur cheeze understand karne lagte hain so uh, ma'am it was wonderful and it is great uh, that you try to cover it in such a short period such a a uh, huge uh, amount it really required if student are saying that they are they have understood uh, 50% or 60% i think i must congratulate them that their concentration was wonderful it's very difficult to have uh, professor kulvinder and your colleagues i would like to tell you that you have wonderful students and if they are like that they should win laurels in future that will be the wonderful aspect of all these things and i enjoyed uh the participation of all the students <laughs> your assignments also and i could see that out of a group of about 33 34 people uh uh agar 33% bachcho ne bhi wo problems kar li to jo organizers hai na wo pass ho gaye exam mein is program ko organize karne mein <laughs> तो हम तो हम सेकंड डिवीजन की तरफ जा रहे हैं तो दैट वाज ग्रेट ग्रेट एंड एक और चीज मैं आपसे कहना चाहता हूं मान साहब ने बोला था अभी स्टोरी खत्म नहीं हुई अब तो स्टोरी शुरू हो रही है फिल्म शुरू हो रही है अभी तो बहुत कुछ बाकी है सो व्हाट एज आई प्रॉमिस आई वेंट टू हेलीडे रेजनिक्स बुक गैदर्ड all those problems which they have identified as problems solvable on a computer using spreadsheets i have already sent that pdf to professor gulvinder hope he will actually uh, post it in the classroom and i think we will be there for a month uh, trying to see you please keep on posting uh, these under that assignment itself and uh, that will be a wonderful thing Uh, आप हमसे ज्यादा कर सकते हैं ये भी मैं आपको बता दूं हम लोग तो जरा थोड़े से स्पेंट फोर्सेस है ना इसलिए हमारी एनर्जी उतनी ज्यादा होती नहीं है आपके पास बहुत एनर्जी है तो वो एक चैलेंज है आपके लिए कि अगले 28 दिन में आपने वो प्रॉब्लम सॉल्व करने की कोशिश करनी है और क्लास में पोस्ट करनी है एंड uh, उसके बाद आप अपने आप से पूछना कि ये जो एक वर्कशॉप थी ये वाकई में वर्कशॉप थी ये सिर्फ लेक्चरबाजी नहीं थी इसमें हमारी कोशिश थी हम आपको कुछ हैंड्स ऑन देने की कोशिश करें और 
आप देखोगे कि आपको बड़े लंबे चौड़े प्रोग्राम लिखने की जरूरत नहीं होती है बड़े लंबी चौड़ी स्प्रेडशीट बनाने की जरूरत नहीं है ये जरूर पता होना चाहिए कौन सी चीज कैसे इस्तेमाल करनी है आप हमारी प्रेजेंटेशन में दोबारा से जा सकते हो यही खूबसूरती है क्लासरूम की वहां सब कुछ रखा हुआ है जब मर्जी खोल करके जा करके उसको देख लो और शेयर करो आपस में ग्रुप बनाओ दो तीन चार लोग इकट्ठे मिलकर टीम की तरह काम करने की कोशिश कर लो अगर आप टीम बना के काम करोगे तो और भी फास्ट चीजें होंगी और आपकी अंडरस्टैंडिंग भी होगी आपने जे जे थॉमसन का नाम सुना होगा सुना है ना सबने फिजिक्स वालों को तो पता ही होता है उसका नाम यस सर डिस्कवर्ड व्हाट इलेक्ट्रॉन ओके तो वो एक बात बोलते थे श्रीमान जी कि अगर आपको कुछ सीखनी होना चाहिए तो आप पढ़ाना शुरू कर दो हम टीचर बड़े ब्लेस्ड हैं हमको आता जाता कुछ नहीं है पर क्योंकि पढ़ाते रहते हैं इसलिए हमको सारी चीजें समझ में आने लग जाती है धीरे धीरे सो इफ यू विल फॉर्म ए टीम ए टीम में आप एक दूसरे को पढ़ाने का काम भी कर सकते हो एक को एक चीज आती है दूसरे को दूसरी आती है तीसरे को तीसरी आती है और वो जो टीम वर्क है ना आज के जमाने का जिसको बोलते हैं मूल मंत्र है वो That is the magic mantra of success of today's times. Work as teams, you will be a success. If you will work in isolation, you will never be a success. So, with these words, I thank uh, my team members, Ma'am Sarmista and Ma'am Sapna. They have done a wonderful job. Uh, it was a joy to be with them in this particular workshop, and hopefully, we will have very many more workshops also. ये तो अभी फिल्म शुरू ही हुई है जारी रहेगी थैंक यू वेरी मच सर आई विल आल्सो लाइक टू थैंक आई विल आल्सो बी अ टीम मेंबर ऑफ योर ग्रुप एंड आई विल वर्क आउट ऑल दोस प्रॉब्लम्स ऑन माय स्प्रेडशीट एंड पोस्ट देम वंस प्रोबेबली द स्टूडेंट्स स्टार्ट पोस्टिंग आई विल आल्सो पोस्ट देम ग्रेट सो वी कैन लर्न फ्रॉम ईच अदर यस सो आई एम I also want to thank the, the organizers and especially Professor Alu Walia who has given me this chance to interact. And Ma'am Sarmista, I have learned a lot, especially from today's lecture. Actually, so how to teach quantum mechanics in class? I've got a new viewpoint. Thank you very much, Ma'am. Sir, it was good. Thank you, Ma'am. Thank you for such a nice and wonderful talk for the today's uh, session. so you have wonderfully explained uh, the uh, use of uh, excel in understanding the difficult concept of quantum oscillator and, and as well as you have compared uh, the quantum oscillator with the classical oscillator so uh, before i uh, hand over the control to dr rukhi singh for the formal vote of thanks i would like to say some few uh, some words uh, regarding this uh, workshop as uh, this workshop uh, is first workshop of uh, our dbt star course team and uh, uh, i want to say uh, thanks to dr uh, p k alwaliya ji for organizing and arranging this uh, workshop uh, for us and uh, remain present for all the six days in this uh, workshop so uh, before uh, uh, i have some words to explain that interdisciplinary or interdepartmental uh, interdisciplinary or interdepartmental activity uh, of dbt sarkar scheme has a focus towards uh, uh, merging all the science departments with each other so Uh, uh, during the advancement of science, we have divided science into different categories like physics, chemistry, zoology, botany, mathematics, etc. Now, uh, as our understanding has reached to the uh, conclusion that all these sciences are linked with each other, so the progress in any branch of science cannot be done or cannot be possible without the help of other branches too. so this is the focus of our uh, uh, dbt uh, uh, star college scheme the dbt means department of biotechnology so department of biotechnology is giving grant or support in the progress of the department of physics and chemistry too 
So the, this is the clear significance of uh, this uh, scheme. Rather, I want to uh, share with you uh, one example that as the as we uh, describe uh, four forces uh, in nature, and uh, we taught uh, this thing in uh, lower classes. And as we go higher uh, in uh, study of uh, physics, uh, there is a field, there is a concept of unification of all the forces. That is, there is only one, only and only one reason behind the force between the two objects. So that uh, is a quantum approach. That is the inter interchange of some particles. So uh, like that. So we have uh, first divided sciences into different uh, categories and. Uh, now we are merging all the science departments with each other. So, uh, one thing more, the aim of this uh, workshop is to break the energy of, of uh, students um, in the direction of uh, Excel. We have uh, uh, shown them to a path uh, or the tool uh, which will be helpful to them. So there is a proverb that speed does not matter, rather the right direction matters. So uh, our aim is to provide uh, the participants the right direction. So that is the purpose uh, of this workshop that they can uh, pursue their uh, science uh, uh, career or, uh, or uh, higher studies in sciences with the help of this toolkit too. So thank you very much. Wish you all the best. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, good afternoon uh, to all of you. Uh, before giving the formal uh, vote of thanks, uh, first of all, I wish to thank here uh, DBD because this uh, one-week workshop was sponsored by Department of Biotechnology on uh, MS Excel spreadsheet. I'm sure that uh, uh, this workshop will be greatly beneficial to our UG students, uh, be it the plotting of the graphs or uh, be it the in evaluating their results using formulae in their calculations using spreadsheet. Uh, also, uh, it was uh, an interdisciplinary activity. I am sure that all the uh, students uh, will be benefited from it. Uh, Alwale sir, a total of uh, 76 students uh, were resist, uh, registered in this workshop, uh, 45 from our college, uh, 2 from uh, local government Arindra College and 29 students from other districts of Punjab. Okay. In addition to it, 8 faculty members from uh, the sciences also participated in this workshop and uh, uh, some PG students were also participated in this. I am extremely thankful to uh, uh, our resource persons that they have uh, shared their assignments with the participants daily and uh, give the daily uh, recordings to them. I am extremely thankful to the uh, resource person as they remained with the participants and uh, they are just like the source of inspiration to all of us particularly uh, uh, all the faculty members and uh, Dr. Sapna ma'am also agree with me uh, that Dr. Aluwalia and Dr. Sarmishta are just like a lighthouse for all of us as they, have, they are so much active and uh, attached to the subject in spite uh, of their retirement. So once again, uh, I am extremely thankful to Dr. Aluwalia, Dr. Sarmishta and Dr. Sapna Sharma for their tireless presence in all the six days. I'm also thankful to all my faculty members from uh, uh, their, for their continuous support in making this workshop a great success. And uh, uh, the feedback form for the students uh, will be shared with you shortly. And they, from that, they will get the certificates. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So I just want to say that Excel is a very wonderful tool for every subject. We can do anything, any any numerical data or any analysis on this Excel sheet. And every resource person has explained it very well. Thank you very much to all the resource persons and the organizers of this workshop for organizing such a wonderful workshop.
तो मैं हिंदी में ही बोलूंगी बिल्कुल बेटा खुशी से मैम सर वैसे मैं ज्यादा बोलती नहीं बट आई रियली एंजॉय दिस मुझे जब मैं फिजिक्स मतलब सेकेंड ईयर में थी तो मुझे था कि हमारे कोर्स में कंप्यूटर होना चाहिए था फिजिक्स में क्योंकि फिजिक्स वाले बच्चों को कंप्यूटर इम्पोर्टेंट है तो तब मैं थोड़ा सा मतलब क्योंकि शायद फिजिक्स में कुछ अधूरा सा है बट जब ये कोर्स मतलब हमें एक के लिए प्रैक्टिस के लिए मिला तो मुझे लगा शायद हमारा वो जो कमी थी वो शायद पूरी हो जाए इससे तो आई रियली थैंक यू टू ऑल योर मेंटर्स एंड एंड डिपार्टमेंट टीचर्स टू ऑर्गेनाइज दिस वर्कशॉप आई रियली थैंक यू थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू नेहा so oh, thank you neha uh, and riya for uh, giving your uh, feedback regarding this uh, workshop i would like to say that uh, i want to announce about the uh, google classroom that it will remain open for next month month so we made it open up to the science day of this uh, year that is the 28th of feb so uh, i have already posted uh, the resnica handy physics book problem and you can solve all these problems with the help of excel i have uh, gone through these problems and these are very very interesting problems and you know in bsc and you can easily solve these problems with the help of uh, microsoft excel or microsoft spreadsheet so you will i i uh, feel and i uh, want to say that you will definitely enjoy it so do it Uh, and break uh, it in the uh, thank you very much now i think we should say goodbye till we meet again and oh, rudinder sir hats off to you it was a really uh, very great effort that you have done for the ug students thank you so much yes special clap for dr mar yes thank you thank you asha ma'am thank you thank you all So actually, the credit goes to the team work of our physics department. We all have collaborated and do the work to make this workshop successful. Thank you. Please, 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 और साहब है ना ये तो बड़ा पीछे पड़े आते हैं तो फिर लगे रहते हैं कि करना है जुट जाना है वी हैव टू अचीव इट एंड आई थिंक दैट इज द रीजन दैट इट इज अ सक्सेस स्टोरी तो थैंक्स टू डीवी कॉलेज बठिंडा मैनेजमेंट फॉर हैविंग सच ग्रेट फैकल्टी देयर टू थिंक ऑलवेज अबाउट द बेस्ट फॉर द स्टूडेंट्स सो आई थिंक नाउ आई एम राइटिंग ऑफ एंड थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू Thank you. Bye. 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 We'll be in touch.